<clears throat> okay, so 85 years old. This is the age of Sir Peter Cook today. He's uh, 85 years old and uh, he's our contemporary uh, and uh, he's one of the youngest 85 years old that I know of. So let's see. Let's say, let's see why I said what I said, that he is one of the youngest 85 years old that I know of. For example, he says, architecture is what you do with the potential of life. I think it's a very generous statement because yes, architecture is what you do with the potential of life. At least this is the perspective of, of a, a, an architect. A painter maybe would say painting is what you do with the potential of life. Uh, a musician would say music is what you do with the potential of life. A writer would say writing is what you do with the potential of life. But again, an architect that is Sir Peter Cook is entitled to say that architecture is what you do with the potential of life. He also said, I want to make it uncomfortable for the Philistine, but for the boring architect, for the person who wants his building to be predictable. This, he, this is what he said when he was 78 and who was knighted in, uh, he, he was knighted in 2007 by Queen Elizabeth II for his services in architecture. So let's see, uh, in 2007, that was 14 years ago. So I guess, uh, you know, he was um, 71 years uh, old when he uh, received this, um, you know, this, uh, should I call it honorary degrees? He is now Sir uh, Peter Cook. But let's read again what he, what he said. I want to make it uncomfortable for the Philistine, for the boring architect, for the person who wants his building to be predictable. Bravo to him, because I think every, every significant gesture in any art is about exactly the same thing to make it uncomfortable for the Philistine and in case of the architect or architecture for the boring architect, for the person who wants his building to be predictable because life itself is unpredictable. So why should architecture be predictable? Unfortunately, most architects do exactly the opposite. Create buildings which are not creative. Uh, and this is the truth. Anyway, let's continue. Here he is, and I like him in this picture. You know, he is, uh, I mean, you know, considering the statement that I just read, uh, you would say um, the Peter Cook, uh, Sir Peter Cook is, uh, you know, pretentious, uh, you know, maybe even arrogant uh, person, but he doesn't look like an arrogant man at all here. In fact, he looks like a man who's in a way struggles with himself and um, tries to move beyond his own limits. And I think he's one of the most modest, um, you know, very well-known architects that I know of, today at least. And uh, this is something to appreciate, I think, and to admire. Sir Peter Cook, a registered architect, uh, born on the 22nd of October, 1936, is an English architect, lecturer, and writer on architectural subjects. He was a founder of Archigram and was knighted in 2007 by the Queen for his services to architecture and teaching. He's also a royal academician and the commander de l'Ordre des Arts and the Lettre de la, of the French Republic. His achievements with Archigram were recognized by the, uh, by the Royal Institute of British Architects in 2004, when the group was awarded the Royal Gold Medal. Uh, as one of the founding members of Archigram, uh, the avant-garde neo-futurist architecture group of the 1960s, the British architect, professor and writer, Sir Peter Cook, 
has been a pivotal figure within the global architectural world for over half a century. One of his most significant works from his time with Archigram, the plug-in city, still invokes <clears throat> debates on technology and society, challenging standards of architectural discourse today. With a love for the slithering, the swarming, and the spooky, Cook has also continued to teach the next generation of architects. He has been chair of architecture at the University College London's Bartlett School of Architecture, and he continues to hold a number of positions as a professor and lecturer around the world, Bartlett being one of the best architecture schools uh, in the world. Some even think the best. So, you know, here is a, a drawing, a, a, you know, a collage <clears throat> uh, with which Archigram uh, manifested its quest for um, changing the, the world. And it was a magic time, of course, in the 60s, you know, uh, early 70s, when people believed indeed that a change was possible. And it was that incredible energy which also generated uh, the great arrival on the musical scene of the, uh, you know, some of the most splendid uh, rock uh, groups uh, in the world, uh, which came from England. And uh, some of them came from England. And uh, it was at that time also, and it's not accidental, that uh, these architects, uh, Archigram, uh, manifested themselves in uh, very provocative ways. Uh, you know, I would, I would feel tempted to say that Sir um, uh, Peter Cook, and I'm not sure if he truly would have insisted that we place in front of his name the three letters S, I, R. Probably not, but anyway. Uh, I think his architecture could uh, point in the direction of a possible psychedelic architecture. Of course, architecture uh, understood conventionally would resist uh, being uh, dragged into the field of the psychedelic creation because we think that architecture is um, only about uh, reality and uh, you know gravity, uh, statics, uh, function, functionalism, uh, and so on, rationalism even. But uh, in my opinion, uh, and probably not only my opinion, his work in good measure, and maybe even more so his, his graphic work, points towards what I might call psychedelic architecture. A psychedelic architecture being an architecture where dream, even uh, hallucinations are welcomed, where, you know, uh, uh, that rejected side of our psychology is manifesting itself with, uh, with fervor. And uh, why not? Why not? He, they showed the way, but uh, there are possible other ways. Surrealism could manifest itself in architecture uh, and uh, a, a possible psychedelic architecture could uh, maybe sometimes at least uh, take us out from the predictability of boredom, or should I say the boredom of predictability. Architecture needs its own new vaccines. He, he said this in, uh, uh, just last year, in the year 2020, after the pandemic started. Let's reflect a little bit on this architecture needs its own new vaccines. Why? Well, perhaps, and maybe without perhaps, Peter Cook thinks that uh, architecture is ill. And it is. It is ill because very rarely, well, I'm not saying, uh, maybe I exaggerate a little bit, but rarely, uh, architects are able to escape that predictability that it was his intention to fight against. Uh, and um, if you have this critical attitude towards architecture, as he does, and out of love for architecture, then 
yes, uh, you are looking for solutions. And a solution might come from what he calls the new vaccines to cure architecture of, uh, of, its, uh, of its problems. How to do that? Well, remains to be seen. It can be done in many ways, but uh, the important thing is to start and the important thing is to want a change. The, the London-based experimental architectural group Archigram, led by Warren Chalk, who died in 1987, so at, at 60, Peter Cook, who was born in 1936, Dennis Crompton, who was born in 1935, David Green, born also in 1937, Ron Heron, who died in 1994, and Michael Webb, born in 1937, has long been a source of inspiration and provocation since its period of activity in the 1960s and 1970s. It is convenient, this is a statement by him, by Peter Cook, it is convenient for mainstream architecture to dismiss certain architects as artists or as academics. But what, hap what happens when the dreamers start to build? or building, when they build on time and on budget. For us, me, Rem Kolhas or Zaha Hadid, Kolhas, who was Kolhas student, it is important and it is the same business. We have to build toilets and houses and we are interested in keeping the water out. But the conversations are more elaborate. It's about extending the vocabulary of architecture. I would say it is true. Uh, but, the, the, but the dreamers are discouraged by all kinds of systems through which the bourgeois, if I can call him so, uh, uh, attempts to, to, to cut the wings off from uh, the body of architecture. Uh, but there are rebellious ones like Peter Cook who still dream. And despite the fact that they dream, they, they sometimes can implement their dreams. And uh, it is true, there are architects and there are good architects who are dismissed by the, 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 the thick and main body of mainstream architecture as being so-called artists or uh, so-called academics, as if being an artist is a sin uh, or an inappropriateness. But how could it be so? Because if you look back in history, and I can give uh, some, you know, sublime names, many architects, some of the best, were artists. Uh, not all of them, yes, but many of them and very important ones. And all of them, I think, thought and felt that when architecture deserves its name, is an art. Uh, I'm thinking of Paul Valéry, who wrote a beautiful short uh, book called Eupalinos, Ul Architect, where he asks himself, himself what is, uh, who is an architect? And he says, there is the one who places a, a stone above another stone, and this is a, a, a builder. Then there is the one who places a stone above another stone and makes them talk, and he's a master builder. And then the third one is the one who places a stone above another stone and makes them sing. Yes, sing. And his name is Eupalinos ou l'architect in French. Eupalinos or the architect. So in the opinion of Paul Valéry, and poets usually have the correct intuitions, only if the architect makes the stones sing, he deserves the name architect, to be called an architect, but to make the stone sing, you must be an artist or a poet. And this is also what Frank Lloyd Wright said, you know, a great architect is by necessity a poet. Uh, not necessarily writing a poem with words, but with bricks. Unfortunately, again, many, many architects are exactly not that, meaning poets or artists, and they ruin the earth. With, 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 with the banality of their works. And it's very sad. 
In his own words, his architecture is lyrical, technical, mechanical, even slightly Gothic. <laughs> you know, this is an interesting, uh, almost amusing statement. Lyrical, technical, mechanical, even slightly Gothic. You wouldn't expect this, would you? But maybe the Gothicism, so-called Gothicism of his architecture uh, is connected with, um, you know, with, uh, yes, in a way with the surrealism of his proposals. Because for the Gothic, the Gothic man and the Gothic times are so removed from us, we as post-Renaissance people, you know, we, we, we cannot comprehend easily the, the medieval world, which is somehow exotically romantic for us. But uh, do we really understand it? Can we understand that there were people who gave their lives completely in complete anonymity to build the cathedral? Chartres or Amiens or Rouen or Reims or Beauvais? Not really. I'm not saying that Sir Peter Cook is attempting to, or was attempting to build a cathedral, but there is something in his work, I think, which, which would uh, make his words here uh, rather legitimate. What role can radical, he was asked, what role can radical experimental visions play in the day-to-day -day worlds of architecture and planning? Uh, and, uh, this is what he wrote. So much architecture is follow my leader stuff. We should encourage individual experiment, speculation and research. Architecture needs its own new vaccines. Most planners and imaginative bean counters. Um, yeah, perhaps we should think about what he said. So Peter, Peter Cook, the actor, when I searched for images, uh, for Peter Cook, I, I came across a man that, you know, I, I, I knew it was not him because I knew how he was looking like. So there is a famous, there was a famous uh, British actor, uh, also called Peter Cook, and this is him, but this is not the architect. Anyway, I, I thought of including him in this uh, presentation because you know, um, I, I, I imagine that Sir Peter Cook, the architect, would, would, would love, you know, uh, uh, a short digression with a humorous touch. Indecently, in, indecently funny in every way. That's how this other Peter Cook was described. And here he is. Actually, the first speech I came across was this one. And uh, I knew how Sir Peter Cook looked like. And, uh, you know, none of these three people look like the one that I, 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 I knew was the architect. This was the, the, the Peter, you know, Peter, Peter Cook, uh, the, the actor. Anyway, the British scene. And here he is in a, I don't know, in a play or in a film. We move forward. Now, this is the architect. But the architect, you know, uh, himself, you know, has his own extravagances. You know, sometimes he sports, uh, um, you know, rather curious shirts, but, but he's not the only one really, you know, Sir Norman Foster also sometimes, uh, at least sometimes, um, uh, is equally courageous in, uh, in his choice of, of shirts, or maybe not equally, but, uh, uh, you know, approaching a certain level of courage. Of course, that courage not so significant as in the case of uh, Bruce Goff, uh, the architect with the most extravagant uh, wardrobe of shirts. Drawings, some drawings by Sir Peter Cook. And uh, I love his drawings, his graphic works. They are, they are indeed, uh, you know, uh, good number of them rather psychedelic. Uh, you know, they are conceptual, but they are also lyrical. And, uh, you know, the, the employment of color and various images, you know, collages, creates a, a, some kind of an anti-reason antidote. And I think we need more of that antidote. Maybe that is the vaccine he was referring to. You know, we are all sick because of an illness called rationalism. 
and uh, how to get out of that illness is uh, you know up to us we have to invent i guess some new vaccines and look at this you know i mean what architect would would do something like this you know uh, of course the, the creator of such a such an image would be considered unserious would be considered uh, unacceptable would be considered uh, uh, impossible uh, it's not architecture is uh, you know uh, just a facile uh, uh, you know adding up uh, you know some kind of superficial images and so on but this man knows how to build he builds so uh, maybe we should reconsider our uh, our understanding of what architecture is yes again how many architects would indulge in such superficialities i am uh, sarcastic towards myself um, but some various serious thinkers thought <clears throat> that life is a dream and if life is a dream why are we continuing to fill the earth with uh, with buildings which uh, do not even acknowledge the existence of dreams why in the name of what i would say in the name of a very poor and simplistic understanding of what reality means because the reality as dostoevsky said includes also the fantastic and he went even further by saying that nothing is as fantastic as reality itself and i believe it is true but that aspect of reality we consider the unreal that as if it's not part of, uh, of existence which is not true at all you know life every day for everybody has so many so-called accidents which are uh, difficult to comprehend uh, uh, you know only rationally and uh, uh, i think we need a world of dreams we need a world of the so-called unconscious the one that we make great efforts not to acknowledge maybe that's why we need the the, the sofa on which uh, dr freud is inviting us to uh, tell the story the untold story of our inner life in a way perhaps sir peter cook tried exactly this to bring to to the fore the uh, rejected the rejected inner life of the architect did he succeed in building uh, you know uh, uh, convincingly in this way well in some uh, cases yes in some other cases perhaps less so but the attempt was there it's important to free the spirit of architecture. We cannot allow, uh, you know, rules and regulations to 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 kill the the, the elan vital, the vital uh, impulse that that should animate imagination, creativity. Otherwise, we become just uh, followers, uh, followers in the bad sense of the word, followers not of our own uh, authenticity as creative people but followers of orders, meaning we are just slaves. Here he is, a slave himself in a way, but you can tell that this man enjoyed what he did. You know, he is, he is, he is like a child, you know, uh, painting there on that piece of uh, paper, which is not even flat. Uh, anyway. So another drawing by him. What do we read there? You know, all kinds of things surprise in the center a little thing what is that i don't know um anyway another one look at this you know uh, again the rationalist would, would ask what is this nonsense well <laughs> you know as as i read archigram opened up new ways of thinking and uh, of, 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 of doing and uh, and uh, it's because they stirred up some energies, some creative energies that are still capable of fueling our own creativity.
yeah he is uh, you know incorporating himself within uh, within uh, you know uh, a graphic work done by himself this is a studio he built um, uh, together with uh, with um, his uh, architecture of his crab we are going to see it later. Now, Peter Cook and Colin Fournier, the Kunsthaus in Graz in, uh, in Austria, which I think is uh, perhaps his best known work. And it is a remarkable work. Uh, this is the section and bravo to the Austrians for building it. And this is the building, yes. It's a provocative building. Yes, it's a building which refuses to be like those around it. Uh, bravo to them. You know, uh, uh, we all need novelty. We all need, uh, you know, uh, to be stirred up, uh, to be incited. Uh, we can't be like this and get ex excited and inciting, incited. It's impossible. We have to do something else to something that belongs to our time and 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 that's what he did you know i think it's a remarkable building both during the day and during the night look at this now of course the timid would say no way but the timids will disappear in the fog of time while those who are not timid will resist and will prosper and in fact will not die that contextualist would say this is totally unacceptable he did in respect in any way the context but you can assume the context also through confrontation you could have harmony through contrast there is such a thing uh, you know it's not you know respecting the context is not just you know bowing your head and mimicking uh, facile uh, usually formal relationship with uh, with what you do no plus which context because it's not just the physical context it's also the psychic context the metaphysical context there are all kinds of contexts it's not just this one the physical one look at the building from above i think it's splendid you know it's it's uh, it's uh, irritating the the conventional mind but uh, that's exactly what he wanted didn't he here they are the architects of this building i already warned you about the shirts of uh, sir peter cook uh, this one is not so again when i think of the shirts of uh, bruce goff uh, every other shirt doesn't matter how extravagant would look uh, would be would look very very you know uh, predictable and, and, and conventional anyway it's a good building and they built it so the dreamer built and i think we need more dreamers who build the world would be much better unfortunately the dreamers very rarely have the occasion to build because they are you know sabotaged by uh, uh, by uh, you know committees those very committees that uh, made the frank lloyd Wright never take part in an architectural competition because he was afraid that uh, you know the committees would not understand it uh, and uh, he said it plainly actually The architect as rebel, but we need such architects as rebels, you know, in as much as we have, uh, we have and had and will have painters as rebels, musicians as rebels, writers as rebels, and so on. We need a rebel. Without the rebel, life is, uh, is, uh, could be unbearable.
alone. This is what we read with big letters on the facade of this uh, unique, unique building. Aren't we most of us alone, especially these days? And I just read uh, the other day, well, two days ago that um, Pope uh, Francis said that, uh, you know, the COVID or the pandemic should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, an occasion for us. The, 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 the tragedy of the pandemic should make us reconsider what we understand by freedom. And he said very clearly that, that somehow uh, what 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 seems to 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 be to be uh, said to us by uh, this uh, tragedy and by uh, all the effects of, of 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 this pandemic is to be together. Well, not necessarily in you know. I mean, I know that the restrictions say we should keep distance, but in uh, at a, at a psychic level, we should be united. It's important to uh, reconfigure, to reconsider, uh, as, as the Pope said, that freedom should have a, a communal character. And unfortunately, in the, in, the, in, the, in the individualism promoted by capitalism, that understanding of freedom is, um, is uh, often uh, not addressed. But I think the Pope is right. And what else is art? The oldest definition of art that I found in the Proto-Indo-European language is art equals bridge equals God. In other words, art is a tool, is a way through which we fight our own loneliness. And it's important to, to, to continue with, with tenacity this attempt to, 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 to dissolve frontiers and to, to promote uh, togetherness. Even if the artist often is condemned to being alone in his solitude, just like in the solitude of the monk uh, who is praying and is praying not just for himself, but is praying for the world. The same way the artist, even when he works alone, is actually working for everybody and is working for breaking down the barriers between each other and in essence to dilute, if not totally diminish and banish uh, what the word alone means. Uh, so I think it's very important for the architects to, um, to, to, to fight also against uh, uh, this uh, uh, malevolent solitude. Not all solitude is malevolent. There are virtues sometimes in, 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 uh, in, in being solitary, but uh, being alone, uh, loneliness could be indeed a, a, an illness. And uh, it's important to communicate, to build bridges. As I said in that earliest de etymological definition that I found, art equals bridge. It's about bridging. Now, another project by him that was built in Australia, the Abendian School of Architecture at Bond University on the Gold uh, Coast of Australia. And here it is. Um, not all his works are, uh, you know, uh, astonishingly radical. No, 
but uh, that's also because it's very hard to be radical and to also implement your uh, radicalism. But in this building as well, in his own way, Peter Cook is fighting being alone, in my opinion. And these uh, interstitial spaces, these uh, you know corridors, the street-like space within the building is in essence advocating the same thing, be together. It's about communication. You see this uh, continuous uh, visual uh, relationships between various parts of the building. Because art, and I include also here architecture, is about opening doors, not about closing doors, but opening doors. And uh, this is the way he uh, attempted exactly this, an, an architecture school almost without walls. And, uh, and, uh, and breaking down the walls, it's, uh, it's an attempt to break down loneliness to open up the building, to dialogue, to conversation, to debate. Uh, uh, it's important to, to, in order to feel alive, to, 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 to feel connected. As a British writer Froster said, only connect. And I think the, the best uh, artists and the best writers and the best musicians and the best architects try to do the same thing, only connect. Now, the Vienna University's law and administration buildings by Kreb Studio. Kreb Studio is his own uh, studio now, and uh, I'm going to show you a little later uh, images of the partners. Um, uh, it's a building that, which I saw. Uh, it's uh, right vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis it is there is a library by Zaha Hadid, and uh, also uh, two buildings or a building with various parts by Carme Pinos. And uh, it's, a, it's a prestigious um, vicinity, of course, because both Zaha Hadid and the Carme Pinos are, are very important architects. I use the present, although Zaha Hadid died, but she actually didn't die. And her birthday will be on the 31st of October. So it will be an occasion to pay homage to her as well here on Zoom. And I invite you. This is actually the building by Carme Pinos. Uh, the building by, uh, by uh, Sir Peter Cook was not very admired by the students that I uh, visited it with. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we didn't actually enter the building. We didn't enter in, in this courtyard. But, uh, you know, uh, taste changes, opinions are subjective. You know, some might like it, some might not like it. Uh, it has indeed an interesting, uh, in my opinion, an interesting uh, treatment of the facade with pieces of wood, which uh, create this, um, you know, rather impressionistic uh, feeling uh, when you contemplate the building, when you look at the building. Uh, I think it's interesting, and interesting is also the color. You know, look at this uh, orange, you know, this uh, powerful, uh, almost violent orange. He loves color. Peter Cook loves color. 
he is not the orthodox timid uh, modernist who only likes whiteness and white walls and white everything, including Zaha Hadid. That building, which is uh, very close to this one, is excessively white, uh, the interior. But not Peter Cook, as you can see, he loves color and not just one color. And indeed, how could you have a psychedelic architecture that is gray or white? It's impossible. He called, uh, Peter Cook called um, Lebia Suds the craggy optimist. And I would say he himself is a craggy, craggy, craggy optimist. This is a nice word, share, you know, to share, to share space, opinions, you know, even belongings, to share everything. Um, I understand that the pandemic is uh, um, uh, for the moment still continues to suggest to us to, you know, uh, restrict ourselves in many ways, but under more so-called normal conditions to share is a noble, uh, endeavor. Because again, it's about communication, it's about uh, uh, breaking down, uh, you know, barriers, it's about fighting loneliness. Not just physical. I mean, just as these two people here communicate, maybe we should all communicate with each other. The building by Zaha Hadid, which is, you know, very close to, to here, in fact, it's somewhere here, you can see it through the window, is illustrated on this, uh, you know, on this screen. It's a library. The playfulness of uh, Peter Cook's architecture has to do, I think, with, um, uh, with his ideals that uh, I read about um, in the, uh, the beginning of the presentation. These are the pieces of wood that I, I mentioned, which are not structural. They are just uh, creating kind of a second skin, which, um, uh, you know, problematizes a little bit, otherwise, um, you know, maybe not so, uh, um, you know, uh, unusual uh, facade of the building. It also brings to the building a certain level of rusticity, something, uh, you know, uh, the, the ruralization of the building, uh, of a, of a building which is uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, very urban. If you, if you do not uh, consider uh, some of the colors, which might be, 
you know, a little bit, uh, you know, anti-urban because of the, you know, uh, freshness, not to say uh, audacity. Now, a building in Berlin uh, built in the 1980s when uh, many architects were invited to Berlin to build, uh, you know, blocks of flats usually, uh, and uh, they did so. And this is the building he, he built uh, with his partner. And it is an interesting building. And he was not uh, so fatally wounded by postmodernism as some other architects. His playfulness is, um, is obvious here as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's uh, animating a block of flats in uh, interesting ways. Sorry. Okay, now some uh, graphic works, some, you know, the so-called project way out of West Berlin, Cheerful Corner. We already saw this drawing at the beginning, but we are going to see a few others. Very unusual for, a, for a, you know, an enlightened uh, modern architect. I was sarcastic, of course. Uh, not towards Peter Cook but towards the other architects who would never draw something like this because they would think it's, um, it's, it's nonsense because it's uh, dreamy and uh, you know too colorful and too unconcerned with what we call function but what if function is is fiction as bernard chumi said bernard chumi said form follows fiction so he replaced the word function with the word fiction. I think if we open up the, the realm of architecture through problematizing and even sabotaging what we understand by function, we create, we could create an architecture that is unpredictable, which is interesting, engaging, uh, probably fragile, uh, not arrogant, but uh, stirring us up uh, in uh, imaginative ways. I think it is important to, to, to open up the body of architecture, to explode it actually, uh, and, and, and start anew, you know, with the, with the vivacity of a new beginning. As Louis Kahn said, beginnings are always in harmony with the human nature. Well, then why are, we, why, are we follow, why are we following dogmas and the déjà vu past? Why? Uh, here he is, a uh, picture of, uh, of Peter Cook. And you can tell this is not an arrogant man. Uh, he might be, you know, at war with a certain understanding of architecture, but he's not arrogant. Now, the drawing studio that he built with Crab Studio his own uh, studio being called Crab. And here they are, uh, the two partners, uh, Peter Cook on the right. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know if I have the name of, of his partner now. Uh, anyway, his younger partner, maybe a former, uh, a former student of Peter Cook, and I love the shoes of his partner. You know, uh, 
I think it's something beautiful when when you have open-minded people, you know, uh, uh, working hard to to change themselves and to change the world. Even if they don't succeed, I think it's important to to dream. And 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 and, and he, the man on the right, even though he's uh, over eighty, he's eighty-five years old today. He was, is, and will remain a dreamer, and so is his young uh, uh, collaborators. You can tell from his shoes. Anyway, this is a crab, and I, I imagine, I imagine, uh, you know, they were aware because actually, crab, uh, the name of their studio is formed from um, four initials. The first one being C, meaning cook, but Probably they enjoyed, uh, you know, the fact that the four letters together uh, create uh, this word, which refers to what we look at right now, meaning a crab. A crab is, a, a, you know, a, a scandalous being somehow, you know, uh, here is another crab. And uh, I think we need, in, in a way, the crab is, is what art is. Maybe all art or all good art or all good architecture is some kind of a crab in the sense that is unusual is uh, is uh, you know maybe even a slightly scaring uh, is uh, our unconscious perhaps is a crab everything that is other is a crab and this is the name of their studio and that's what they build they build this uh, this pavilion for uh, for drawing during the construction And now more in the spirit of uh, what I call psychedelic architecture, and more perhaps even in the spirit of his own architecture, I would have splashed some colors on this, uh, you know, wall which becomes a ceiling or a roofing. Is it yeah, just too white? And I mean, you know, even if it's a light gray, whatever it is, but somehow his drawings, or maybe maybe he was expecting the students. Uh, you know, who draw here to, to do that job. And I hope they did it or they will do it. Art is always other and drawing is an art. And as such, the building destined for uh, drawing should also be so-called other. But the interior, in my opinion, is not so-called other enough. But let's hope that, uh, I mean, that could change. You just bring in some graffiti artists and they will make it other immediately. Some sketches by him. PC, Peter Cook. Okay, and now a work in progress, Valeka's housing. Well, this was in, uh, the, the picture was taken in 2016. The work was supposed to be accomplished by 2019. Uh, I don't think it was. I couldn't find pictures of, of the work uh, finalized, but uh, here it is. It's a housing complex. I prefer his drawings, his collages. They are more colorful, more dreamlike, but uh, we all know that when the, dry, the dream collides with the so-called reality, um, it changes. It seems to be more alive somehow during the construction as a building site. But the plan 
you know, it's it's nice. The plan is, uh, you know, playful. Let's hope some some of this playfulness will uh, will uh, uh, will be arrived at in the completed work. He seems to like blue. We know that uh, the building uh, that I began the presentation with, with in Austria uh, is also blue. Now, uh, I found this project, but I don't think uh, it, was, um, it was implemented yet. Peter Cook's Crab Studio to start on uh, Bon Mouse Innovation Hub. Um, it's a project. Now you see here the opposite color. Now you have blue, but then you have orange and uh, in the circle of colors, they are opposite colors. Rather pale uh, rendering here. Anyway, a project, I, let's hope it will get built. And now uh, I, uh, I, I show uh, uh, his second uh, prize, uh, um, winning scheme uh, for this competition in Taiwan, which was won by a Romanian team, uh, the Tower of Droplets. I will also show uh, uh, the work of the Romanians. So uh, the Tower of Droplets, uh, droplets uh, in Taiwan, the competition entry, and uh, this is Crab Cook Robotham Architecture Bureau. Now I know the name of that man with those interesting uh, uh, shoes or sneakers, Robotham. So C R A B Crab. And this is the tower they proposed and they won the second prize with. Now, you know, this was supposed to be a conceptual project. And uh, so the dream part of the project is uh, in a, you know, in a more abundant way present. You, can, you might call it a futurist tower. Look at the sections. Uh, I think they are interesting. And, uh, you know, maybe one day, although Considering uh, the times we live in, maybe you know building such uh, you know technologically uh, astute buildings uh, uh, is a little bit problematic. Although here, from what I read, this was a building which was supposed to generate uh, algae, and uh, you see this algae-producing tower designed by Sir Peter Cook and Gavin Robotham, 
of London studio Crab came second in the recent Taiwan Tower Com Com Conceptual International Competition. Uh, I will show again, as I said, and I will end the presentation with, uh, with showing the, the winning entry, meaning the first prize. But this project by uh, Peter Cook and his partner um, features a tower with a series of steel cages attached that will be covered in algae to produce biofuel. So in this sense, this work was, uh, and this is a project from 2010, I think, so 11 years ago, um, it is, uh, was anticipating in a way the, 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 the problems we have today, which, which uh, we can solve if, if, if we uh, move beyond uh, you know, our uh, very uh, consumptive uh, uh, obsession with, uh, you know, energy, 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 uh, production, 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 and consumption, consumption, consumption. It's a futurist project, maybe with some difficulty uh, feasible, but uh, you have to start with a dream, and that's how they did. Actually, the, the second prize project, meaning theirs, has something in common a little bit with the first prize uh, winning entry, which you are going to see uh, very shortly. Now, this is the project that won this competition. Unfortunately, there was a second phase where, you know, this, this project, uh, I think, arrived on the third place. It, you know, was, was not uh, winning and was not going to be built. But this uh, floating observatory is by Upgrade Studio, Dorin Stefan uh, Architecture Bureau, and, uh, and uh, Mihai Krachun. Uh, they won the first prize. So this conceptual tower for Taiwan by Romanian firms Upgrade Studio, DSBA, and Mihai Karchun in the USA. Uh, I mean, Mihai Karchun was at that time in the USA, but a uh, Romanian architect would feature observ observation decks, decks floating up and down each side on helium balloons. Uh, and, and here is the building that they proposed. And I think, uh, I think uh, there are some relationships between the proposal of the Romanian teams and uh, the, you know, the proposal by uh, uh, Peter Cook and his partner. And I would say not just that particular project by uh, Peter Cook, but also you know, his uh, other works. There is a belief, an optimistic belief in, in uh, in technology, in uh, playfulness, and this building uh, also, uh, maybe to a larger extent or a more intense extent, uh, uh, believes in. Also, the the the, uh, the 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 assuming of biology, because although it is a building, uh, you know, highly technological, there is a uh, uh, you know. Uh, a movement within the building that refers to biological processes. Now, these things, uh, indeed, these observation decks are a little bit, uh, you know, puzzling for me. I don't have enough, you know, uh, technical knowledge to um, uh, assess them, but they, they, they were meant to be very large. You see here, the, you know, human beings, I mean, uh, they are indeed uh, so-called futuristic, but a courageous, creative work, and uh, and, and and we need we need something like this. Uh, we we need uh, we need to to fight off uh, 
uh, you know, timidity. So this was the project team, Doreen Stefan, uh, the architect leader, and then Mihai Bogdan Krachun, a partner in, in projects. So it is Krachun from USA and Bogdan Kipara, Claudio Bursan Pipu, uh, Juana Nitsuika, uh, Anda Stefan, Adrian Aren, Corina Fodor, architects working uh, with, uh, with Doreen Stefan. So they won the first prize and it was a, you know, an important uh, competition with, uh, I don't know, uh, close to 300 uh, entries or something like this. So Peter Cook, uh, whose 85th birthday is today, obtained the second prize. And this is the first prize for that competition. I'm not uh, very sure I understand very well uh, this entity in the lower left corner, but that's because I have myself a problematic relationship with money. I don't know what was meant by money tree, but otherwise, you know, trying to connect with nature, starting from, you know, a simple leaf and even, uh, you know, you see the lacking number, bringing these elements into a, into a high tech tower, uh, is, I think, inspiring. You can find the details of this project and, uh, uh, you know, additional explanations uh, on the zine with, where it is published uh, extensively. And, and that's where I took this, uh, these images from. Again, I, I think there are some relationships between the work of these Romanian teams, the Romanian architects, and in general, the oeuvre of uh, uh, Sir Peter Cook. It is clear that these architects, just like him, do believe in the power of dreams. And they try through uh, approaching the dream to build or to imagine buildings that would add a new dimension to, to human existence, adventurous as it is. But in the absence of adventure, what kind of a moving forward of culture could we uh, arrive at?
Now I will end this presentation, uh, uh, which is an homage to Sir Peter Cook, uh, by showing a project which was just published on Arch Daily and Design uh, uh, by uh, this uh, uh, well-known uh, architect of our time, uh, Ajaye, and his office, Ajaye Associates, because I think uh, his work somehow um, somehow has. Uh, uh, maybe, or maybe I, I just project my own uh, insecurities or even a certain pessimism in it, but might have different uh, meanings than uh, the two uh, towers that we just saw. This is a project that he, a tower that he imagined, uh, Ajaye, for uh, New York City. I, here we see a tower which is in construction by Big, Bjarke Ingels, uh, and uh, it is a little bit somehow disturbing in the sense that, you know, it, it is becoming uh, usually uh, taller buildings become uh, smaller and smaller towards the top, but he does the opposite. That's why it is called inverted. And uh, I remember once I wrote something about the tower proposed by uh, La Tour Saint Fin, the tower without an end by uh, uh, Jean Nouvel where I actually called it not a skyscraper, but an earth scraper. And in a way, this is an earth scraper too. It is as if it fell from the sky on earth. Usually, again, the tower gets smaller and smaller towards the top, not vice versa. Here is it's, 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 it's getting bigger and bigger uh, towards the top. So there is an inversion here, and that's why it is called uh, the inverted uh, tower by Ajaye. But uh, Bjarke Ingel, since I mentioned him, uh, imagined one the very opposite. You know, if you look at Ajaye here and you look at uh, Bjarke Ingels here, you realize that it's almost the same tower, except that uh, one is upside down. Now, which one is upside down? I guess we'll say this one. But otherwise, they are, they are very similar. I am not a great admirer of this work by Bjarke Ingels, and I'm happy it was not built. The, the tower that, re, that replaced the World Trade Center, its two towers, is this one here by uh, David Charles and SOF, although Daniel Lipskin won the competition. But this is the work by uh, David Ajaye, and the reason I thought that I could end this presentation on Peter Cook with this project by Ajaye is because somehow, I don't know if consciously or unconsciously Ajaye by inverting the skyscraper uh, seems to bring to, to the conversation table, so to speak, uh, the question, uh, the question about the very validity of tower, of the tower and the very validity of technology itself used uh, with uh, the aplomb that uh, we were accustomed to for the past uh, number of years, uh, you know, going higher and higher and higher. And here Ajay, Ajay although he, he proposed a, a skyscraper, somehow its meanings to me appear to be a little bit uh, so-called dark, because why would you invert a skyscraper? It's, it's almost like its own negation in a way. But the, the, the ground floor is almost conventional. In fact, maybe without almost, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, almost conformist. And so are the interiors, you know, uh, large pieces of glass, you know, ignoring the climate change and the, uh, you know, the energetical, the, 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 the crisis of energy and so on. You know, this kind of corporate uh, look that is, you know, mainstream, it's actually mainstream, but the, but the meaning of the tower itself, to me is, uh, is uh, asking questions rather about the legitimacy of continuing to build skyscrapers. And I don't know if this was the intention of Ajaye or not. This is my personal reaction upon uh, seeing the project uh, just uh, the other day. And here it is, 
the last image of this presentation. Uh, and maybe it would be interesting to compare in our minds the two towers that we saw proposed for the, the competition in Taiwan by Sir Peter Cook and then the Romanian team, uh, and this tower proposed by Ajay for uh, Manhattan. Thank you, and happy birthday, Sir Peter Cook. <laughs>